Well, good whatever it is for you right now. Um, you're about to take a number theory class with me and you probably have good reasons to do so, but before we start, let's just talk real quick about what number theory is, what number theory can do for you, and what we're going to do with numbers in this class. So, well, why did number th why are people interested in number theory anyway? Well, because numbers are really cool. Certainly numbers are really cool for well, okay, for people who are interested in numbers, and, and hopefully you are one of them, because otherwise this class won't be that great. But working with numbers has always also been a bit of a survival mechanism in the uh, early days of humanity before any kind of recorded civilization. Uh, whole numbers and counting still were humanity's first encounter with mathematics, where people had to decide, for example, how many tribe members would go to hunt, how many tribe members would gather, uh, did as many tribe members come back as went out to hunt and to gather, gather things like that. Um, and, well, after the first very simple encounter of just determining how many certain things are, immediately on the heels of that came arithmetic. So, for example, in the earliest days of agriculture, as well as for nomadic tribes, it was important to determine how many days there were until winter because if you don't get your crops in before the winter, um, you may not make it through the winter. And if you are a nomadic tribe and you get stuck in the snow, that's also not that good. Um, similarly, then, you can answer questions such as how much food is needed to eat every day, because, after all, you need, to you need a certain amount of energy to make it through the winter. And then there is certainly barter and a barter and trade economy, where you need to determine uh, how you trade a cow versus a sheep versus sacks of grain and so on and so on. And so even though, of course, all of this from a modern day point of view is terribly primitive, these were very real concerns. And so it then continued to develop into formal work with numbers where early astronomers used the constellations in the night sky to answer questions such as how many days there would be until winter. Um, because uh, you're basically astro astronomers, one of the earliest tasks for astronomers was to make calendars. And early accountants were the kinds of people who made sure that the tribe or the city had enough food to make it through the winter, as well as working out ways to barter and trade different kinds of goods for each other. But this formal work with numbers also revealed that different numbers have different properties. For example, six pieces of gold can be shared evenly among two, three, and six people, whereas seven pieces of gold can only be shared evenly among seven people. Now that is not something that in the early days of civilization or even today is something that, that people are terribly concerned with. If you've got seven pieces of gold and you have to share it among six people, you take that last piece, take an axe, and cut it into as many small pieces as you need. Um, however, that kind of thing ultimately led to the first observations about numbers. And it is the kind of thing that fascinates people who like numbers, and it fascinated people as early as the ancient Greeks, which is where my knowledge of history ends. It can certainly be that um, earlier days, there, uh, I, there certainly were earlier days in which numbers were used, but records get fuzzier and fuzzier, and as I said, I did not really research into that that much. I'm not a historian. Okay, if we're looking at the question, why do we want to work with number theory from a modern perspective? Well, then certainly the fascination with properties of numbers persists, and, and that is just people who are interested in mathematics, people who are interested in numbers simply play with numbers. Uh, so, for example, isn't it cool that the number 8675309 is a prime number? That is something, um, yeah, I mean, I, either you're fascinated by that or you're not. Um, but then the other question also is, how can we figure this out? How can we, how can we prove it? Uh, computers talk and think. Well, okay, now first of all, computers neither talk nor think in the actual sense of the word. They are computers and they're called that way because they compute. They neither talk nor think. They just mess with numbers, but they mess with whole, with whole numbers. The numbers are binary, but I mean, that doesn't really matter that much. So computers are essentially a huge modern application of various things of ma in mathematics, including some number theory. 
Uh, internet security is then something that is a huge modern day industry for number theory because the security of internet commerce largely depends on there not being a fast factorization algorithm for integers. And uh, that is something that we will talk about in this course. Let's take a look at it. Yes, we're going to take a look at it right now. So take a look at internet commerce. You've got a server at a company. You have clients, people who want to buy stuff from the company. And uh, well, then stuff is sent back and forth, right? Clients send orders. The company sends back a bill. The client sends credit card numbers. And that's, of course, where things get problematic. And so let's take a look at client X here. And let's look at the traffic in a little bit more detail. Basically, when you pay, the server sends you an encryption key or an encryption mechanism. And then, of course, you send your credit card in hopefully sufficiently encrypted information so that an attacker who would monitor the server, cl server client traffic, uh, that attacker can see the information that goes back and forth, but you hope that the information is sufficiently encrypted so the attacker cannot decrypt your credit card number and steal your identity. Well, now the interesting thing here is the attacker, if they see how, what encryption key is sent, then the attacker knows how to encrypt the information. And one of the things that uh, basically the intelligence community has dealt with literally for uh, thousands of years is how can you set up an encryption mechanism where the ability to send messages does not automatically also give you the ability to decrypt messages. And, and that at the beginning, if you think of uh, simple encryptions that you may have done in games already, that sounds almost impossible. But one of the things that we're going to talk about in this course is public key encryption, which does exactly that. OK, so what is number theory? Number theory is mainly the theory of whole numbers. It really is the theory of integers. That does not mean that rational numbers, real numbers, and complex numbers aren't numbers. They are numbers, too. Uh, but they've got so many properties that they are more often than not really considered in algebra because they are what is called fields. They are something where you can also divide and where you have, in the end, a continuum of numbers. So there are more properties out there. They are not a discrete number system like the whole numbers, which are all basically isolated from each other. Uh, surprisingly enough, even though division is an iffy proposition with whole numbers, not to mention when we work with natural numbers, you even have trouble with subtraction, right? Uh, there are quite a few beautiful things that we can do with whole numbers, including division of whole numbers. And that leads us to a quick description of what we will do in this course. So let's take a look at that. The topics we will cover include, well, we first are going to recap some frequently used tools like sequences, induction, and sums. But then we'll talk about representation of integers and their operations. And that gives us an idea how long computations will take. Uh, and uh, it will also give us a way to encode long integers. I'm not sure if I wanted to say that right here a little bit later, but well, let's, let's just uh, let's keep going here. Okay, so the role of prime numbers within the integers then. And uh, then we'll also talk about something that is called arithmetic modulo m, which is basically like arithmetic on a clock face, where after you count beyond a certain number, like on a clock face to 12, it starts wrapping around again to uh, 1. And uh, that, among many other things, is the key to working efficiently with arbitrarily large numbers. And for that, let's take a quick look at something that I can do in a computer algebra system. And that is that, I mean, of course, we, we trust computer algebra systems. And so here, for example, I have a 15-digit number that I want to square. And as we trust computers, it should happen that as I hit enter here, uh, or as I hit equal, I ought to get the result. I ought to get the answer, right? But now let's also realize that if you square a number that ends in the last digit 5, then the square of that number, you can work that out for yourself, the square of that number will also end in a 5. However, and this is not a typo here, and this is as, as wide as this thing go, this square according to this computer algebra system, ends in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 zeros. Well, that, that, that is highly unlikely, and in fact, it's incorrect, because 
This number here, if I split off the 5, I've got a number that ends in 0, so that's where it would end in 0. But then the 5 times the number with that ends in the 0 would also end in 0, but the 5 times 5 would be 25, and so that means this digit here, no matter what the rest is, this digit here really must be a 5. Okay, so there is a problem here, and that problem is resolved fairly simply, and that is, and this is true for every computer algebra system that is commercially available unless it has an arbitrary position function, a uh, computer algebra system have a limited number of precise digits. For example, MathCat right now operates in this version with 17 precise digit, digits. And if you look at this, 15 digits squared would be 30 digits. And what I have here is 13 zeros at the end and 17 digits that we can find reasonably trustworthy. For most computations, the 15, 17 digit precision of a computer algebra system is perfectly fine because, I mean, typical measurements don't have that many digits of precision and so as long as your computation doesn't take that long, this effect back here never really comes to pass. It, it, it never really starts bothering us in any way. But if we want to work with really, really large numbers and to have safe encryption keys, for example, we must work with really large numbers, we cannot, um, uh, we cannot be satisfied with this tail of zeros here. And so this arithmetic modulo m, one of the things that arithmetic modulo m does is it encodes arbitrarily large numbers for us using something called the Chinese remainder theorem. Uh, then of course there is the mentioned public key cryptography and that is one of the reasons why number theory right now is so important. It's not just really really cool, it really is a huge application in the private sector as well as in the intelligence community. And, uh, well, then primality testing is something that we'll talk about, and that's because prime numbers are needed for the public key algorithms. And we will talk about factoring, because basically factoring is the flip side of primality testing. Now, all of this will be hard. We'll be doing proofs. We'll be looking at really, really sophisticated algorithms. And so then, for example, if you look at factoring, you think factoring is easy, but can you really factor the number... Let's see, what is it here? 53,198,462,357. And, uh, well, let's see, if I want to be a bit of a smart aleck about it here, and if you get to know me, you realize that I certainly enjoy that, I could simply say, well, that is what? That's 11 digits there, so I could say 53,198,462,357. I could give MathCAD the right keyword, which is factor, and I would get the factorization, and the factorization is this, and you realize, uh, on one hand, yes, computers will help us with factorizations quite a bit, but we need to determine what the factorization algorithms in computers are, and second of all, factoring, if you don't have numbers that cooperate, because apparently 4787 and 111,131 both are prime numbers, once the factors don't really cooperate, you end up with numbers that are pretty darn nasty, and you really don't want to do this with paper and pencil. As much as we push paper and pencil work for two-digit numbers, three-digit numbers, four-digit numbers, and so on, for as long as it's reasonable, just so you can develop some number sense beyond a certain limit, you really have to use the technology, right? And so, basically, here's the factorization again. That is hard, but that's why we do it. And so that's the end of this introduction. I hope you've gotten a little bit of an overview as to what we're going to do. And, uh, well, now we're going to get to it. I'll see you in the first presentation that has content. Bye.